Okay, I think we're ready to start. Um, I'm Kate Bartlett. I'm the dean here, and it, it, I'm going to give you your, your midday welcome and add my welcome to those you've already received. And I want to start by thanking the student organizers. The idea of an annual Hot Topics Conference in Intellectual Property began with a student initiative four years ago, and every year this conference just keeps getting better and better. So I want to con uh, congratulate especially David Bro and, and Mark Lavender and, and other members of the IP Society for, for making this happen this year. I also want to thank uh, our many sponsors which have made this event possible. Myers, Beagle, Sibley, and Sajovich have sponsored this event, I believe, from the, very, from the very beginning. We have the support this year of the Triangle IP Law so Association, another great IP law firm, Dow Lowndes and Albertson, and then our own Center for the Study of the Public Domain, which has been a catalyst for a lot of the intellectual property activity that, that happens here at the law school. And of course, I want to thank the, um, the speakers and participants in this conference. I know you all had something else you could have been doing today, but uh, you're here and we're very grateful for that. I'm thrilled to have as part of my um, duties today the introduction of George Gilder. Mr. Gilder is an independent scholar who has written a number of important works on wealth and poverty, including the landmark work Wealth, wealth and Poverty, published in 1981. He pioneered the formulation of supply-side economics when he served as chairman of, of the Lehrman Institute's Economic Roundtable, as program director for the Manhattan Institute, and as a frequent contributor to A.B. Laffer's economic reports. Mr. Gilder was a speechwriter for a number of important figures, including Nelson Rockefeller, George Romney, and one of our graduates, Richard Nixon, and was repute, reputed to be at one time President Reagan's most frequently quoted living author. I've got to say that's my most favorite part of this introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gilder has taught at the Kennedy Institute at Harvard, founded the academic journal Advance, and written for the Harvard Business Review, the Wall Street Journal, Forbes Magazine, and The Economist. He, he currently is editor-in-chief of the Gilder Technology Report, from which you can get advice on high technology investment, He's written ex especially extensively and futuristically about high-tech and telecommunications, coining new terms like telescosm, which is the subject of a, 19, of, of a 2002, may I say, bestseller? Uh, here and there. Close, yeah, cl well, well, we'll use that term. 80,000 copies. 80,000 copies. His newest book, The Silicon Eye, How a Silicon Valley Company Aims to Make All Current Computers, Cameras, and Cell Phones Obsolete. Uh, is due for release today. Unfortunately, we don't have a stack of, of books here. Uh, we might have had to wait for a week or so for that, but uh, we're certainly glad to have George Gilder here. He is now Senior Fellow and Program Advisor for Discovery Institute's Technology and Democracy Project. Um, we're very fortunate to have a thinker on the leading edge of high-tech and, and entrepreneurship and telecommunications issues. Please join me in welcoming George Gilder. Thank you, ben. So these are uh, sometimes called Rembrandts in the Attic, and it's the uh, name of a book about the discovery of all sorts of bizarre patents that later turn out to be enormously valuable. And there are various examples that something might be awry in the patent world. Uh, the most striking example I've encountered was uh, learning at lunch today that Nathan Mervold, who was uh, the leading intellectual at Microsoft, has started a company called Intellectual something or other, Intellectual uh, Ventures, uh, that's raised between 250 and 400 million dollars just to go out and collect patents and uh, and litigate them. Uh, it's kind of gratuitously finding these free-floating patents and extorting money from companies that uh, uh, were so innocently didn't believe they were uh, violating them. But anyway, uh, there's, uh, I find in a lot of patents I encounter the duh factor, you know, one-click shopping, uh, Rambus, uh, doubling the data rate. Uh, it's, it wasn't an idea that was significant. It duplicated an idea that's used in all sorts of other areas in uh, 
the DRAM. Uh, then there is the multimedia patent, the infamous Compton patents, and Lemelson, who uh, supposedly was the world's greatest inventor, chiefly went around collecting patents and clustering them around uh, established uh, patents. So, uh, so I've had questions about patents. I'm not an expert on patents, but I've been immersed in the semiconductor industry for decades, uh, studying companies and watching how they function, and uh, also uh, studying software. And it seemed to me that the critical point is to eliminate this duh factor. Uh, a, Patents are only significant even if they're non-obvious and non-incremental, because an incremental patent is by, almost by definition obvious. It's the next step. And if you can patent the next step, uh, and much, much of software consists of next steps, you can essentially bring the whole industry to a halt. So I, I think, uh, you know, the idea that that uh, you take an auction or a transaction or something and move it from an, its previous environment to the web and you've made some invention is just uh, false. It's a spurious extension of the concept of intellectual property. And I think what is going on here is a violation of the laws of abundance and scarcity that underlie every economic era. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, entrepreneurs exploit abundances, exploit what is abundant commonly to relieve the scarcities. And uh, they end up naming their era. And uh, now we're in what's called the age of abundance. And in an information age, what is scarce? Certainly not information. Uh, indeed, this is really an era of informational abundance and, uh, and also of material abundance. Uh, there are occasional scarcities of material resources, but overwhelmingly through history, the price of material resources has been declining, and it continues to decline even amid war and uh, over uh, and other uh, disruptions. What's scarce in an age of abundance? In an age of abundance, the pressure of scarcity migrates to the residual resource. What's scarce when everything else is abundant? And that residual resource is time. And we all, the conferences I attend, are preoccupied with issues of time. Time to market, turn around time, disk seek and rotate time memory latency time, delay time, all kinds of time preoccupy conferences. And, but I think you can sum up all these limits of time in two ways in uh, information technology, the speed of light and the span of life. One's a physical limit, one's a biological limit. Now the light speed limit really governs all uh, information technology uh, from satellite transmissions, which uh, uh, take some 250 milliseconds to reach the Earth, to the movement of bits across a microchip, a nine inches a nanometer. I mean, nine, yeah, nine inches in a nanometer is the general time it takes for information to pass across the surface of a microchip. And, Nine inches in a nanometer for a device the size of your thumbnail might seem to be ample until you realize that the average microchip these days contains about seven miles of uh, microscopic wires. And so uh, the speed of light definitely has come to bear uh, to constrain uh, developments in the microchip. And uh, the software impact is significant because uh, uh, the light speed limit is an ultimate source of Moore's law. As you put the transistors closer together, uh, the information can pass from one 
in transistor to another more rapidly. So the, the reason denser chips, you have more uh, transistors on a chip, the faster, cheaper, and better it is, is because uh, it lowers uh, the speed of light delay. All the information can pass among transistors faster. So, so the ultimate um, source of uh, the advances in hardware really do relate to uh, the impact of the light speed limit, that uh, a crucial hardware scarcity. And, uh, you know, when they had a big debate over whether the browser was, could be integrated in the operating system legitimately by Microsoft, uh, I, f I always I found that a really bizarre kind of argument that it was somehow illegitimate to integrate more functions into the operating system at a time when the microchip was const on which the operating uh, system depended and uh, the instruction sets which it tapped uh, were all being constantly integrated as a result of Moore's law. So, uh, you know, Microsoft put the browser in the operating system after Intel uh, integrated all kinds of uh, new functionality on the microprocessor. So to object to this um, uh, incremental advance seemed to me to be alarming. So uh, I believe the rule that will, evolve, that will govern the evolution of networks and uh, and the topology of information systems is that in the network core, software will tend to harden. And in the network edge, hardware will tend to soften. Uh, the, uh, the core of the network ultimately will reduce to its light speed dimensions. It will be transparent glass, you know, essentially fiber optics, was made by God for communications, and, uh, and, it, uh, and it will tend to dominate all the internal dimensions of uh, the network. While on the edge, there is an increasing proliferation of devices, and, uh, and uh, they will tend to become increasingly configurable, adaptable, programmable, and uh, so the edge will uh, soften and the core will harden. And gone will be the 25 million lines of software code and all these central office switches and, and uh, telecom nodes uh, all across uh, the global network. In the United States, it's particularly bizarre because we divide our uh, telecom networks into 50 different states and then have uh, multiple LATAs, uh, regions in each state, and each one has to have a long distance telecom node, and each call has to go through the long distance telecom node, be massaged by millions of lines of software code, and all that sh should go away as the all optical network arises. At the other end, at the edge of the network, gone in already is the increasingly is the hardwired TV and phone, which are uh, unprogrammable devices to a great, great extent. And they'll all be replaced by programmable teleputers, as I've been calling them for decades. Maybe somebody else, you can call them those, that too if you want. Um, so uh, dictates um, modular software on the edge of the network. The software isn't going to be in lots of big uh, servers. It's increasingly going to migrate to the edge of the network. So software and security and trust and all those functions will tend to migrate to the edge of the network, to these teleputers that increasingly will be handheld devices. Cell phone, omnibus cell phone sort of are the exemplary teleputer, and they already are more potent technologies than uh, the desktop computer. The desktop computer is inferior, really, to the cell phone and, and compute capability. Certainly, if you measure the efficiency of computer capability per watt, communications ca capability, um, the video and photographic uh, capabilities are all superior in the most advanced cell phones. So, 
So increasingly, the locus of software is going to be on handheld devices, uh, billions of them around the world. They better be robust uh, applets, cheap, uh, robust uh, software uh, modules to, uh, that correspond, correlate to this topography. So that's the speed of light and its essential implications on the structure of information technology. The other is the span of life, which is more interesting to many of us. Uh, in business, the span of life is summed up as the customer's time. And in uh, software, it's, it's uh, summed up as the programmer's time. And uh, in the really, to a great extent, the existing software model is the same one that emerged in the 1960s when a completely different regime of abundances and scarcities. In the 1960s, computer cycles were costly. It took uh, $300 an hour to timeshare a DEC VAX mini computer. Uh, and a programmer was cheap. Uh, it was cost 300 bucks a week to hire a programmer. P programmers were abundant and uh, computer time was soft. So the rule was by all means waste the programmer's time and save the computer's time. And that was really the old software model. Now computer cycles, of course, are virtually free. Uh, the programmer is costly. And uh, in the new model, the great goal is to save the programmer's time, not the computer's time. And, uh, and, uh, and the second one is to uh, save the customer's time, because that's uh, with this uh, uh, portable teleputer that is going to bear around, which will be combined with various display technologies, both uh, microvision has created a display that actually writes on your retina at incredible low power, which uh, vastly increases the efficiency and the potential resolution of uh, transferring images to eyes, which is really what a display does. So uh, time is scarce, ideas are abundant. And under those circumstances, I think software patents waste time and subsidize ideas. They waste what is scarce in order to promote what is abundant. And uh, we want a model that may waste ideas but saves time, and that's uh, modularity and interoperability. And uh, you know, the way I first, it first came to mind, it first became obvious to me that this patent business was out of hand. I mean, it really, not just the duh factor, but the really um, racketeering factor is that uh, when they started patenting business models. I mean, that's what businesses do, is uh, design strategies that compete in the marketplace. And you don't need to have more incentives to uh, innovate in business models. If businesses don't innovate in business models, they die. So the whole idea that uh, of these should be laughed out of court. I don't know why anybody even thought they were uh, tenable. But the fact that people did suggests that there's a, prom there's a promiscuous attitude in the courts and in uh, um, about patents and what intellectual property is, that it's, that it's gone uh, way over the market area, has been uh, uh, contracted in uh, uh, sort of legal and litigation domains have been expanded, and it's, it's really uh, amazing. So, um, I've, and the result of this is uh, this misconception about patents is that uh, every time you go to a technology conference, you get, they're just full of disgruntled inventors who think that their uh, bright ideas should necessarily yield huge revenues. And, and these inventors also have conspiracy theories 
about uh, big companies stealing their ideas, and the whole, kind of, the whole array of it is, seems to me pretty silly. Um, most of the time, these ideas are incremental, so they shouldn't uh, have been patented to begin with, or, or they're obvious. And, uh, and they violate Drucker's law, Peter Drucker's law, which is in order to displace an incumbent technology, you have to be 10 times better. At, at, to completely displace an incumbent system. And that is a big uh, obstacle to surmount. And the vast majority of uh, these uh, ideas do not, do not uh, uh, function. So, um, and as, as a result, we are also, we're, so we're, we have a glut of ideas and uh, uh, increasingly, a dearth of the capability of actually realizing these ideas. Uh, uh, when the ideas are non-obvious, that's only the first step. They also should be reduced to practice. You've got to demonstrate that, the that you not only have the idea, but also you can implement the idea in a practical form. And uh, that uh, capability is declining to some degree in the United States, and China now graduates more English-speaking engineers than we do. And this is uh, portentous, and 10 more overall, 10 times more engineers overall. And, and I think that uh, there is an imbalance, and I don't say that the patent system itself is the only cause of it, but it, but it does, in fact, manifest a kind of fetishism of the inventor that uh, is not uh, really valid and, uh, and distorts the economy and compromises the future of our technology businesses. And so uh, the result of this, we can't really uh, seem to be able to deploy broadband in this country. Partly it's the 50 states problem that I was describing before. That's crucial. but. Uh, the result is Korea today, a little country about the size of France, has uh, 40 times more bandwidth per capita than we do. 40 times more per capita. And Japan has, I, I calculated that about a year ago. It's, it's more now. And uh, Japan was about 10 times. And it's, it's been deploying uh, broadband uh, tremendously fast. And we just don't seem to be able to do it. We're falling farther and farther behind while the FCC redefines broadband downward. So you have uh, 200 kilobits a second is alleged to be broadband. And uh, this is, um, uh, so we're, we're waste, as a result, we're wasting the customer's span of life, wasting the customer's time. We, Put them in a queue. Uh, 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 incarcerate them in phone mail jail, listening to Rhapsody in Blue at three kilohertz. Uh, <laughs> we, um, we sit them on a couch for as long as seven hours a day, uh, watching a stream of lowest common denominator images, some called entertainment, some called news almost impossible to differentiate one from another, all in order to catch his eyeballs for a few moments of advertising that most of the time he doesn't want to see for goods and services that most of the time he doesn't want to buy. This is television, and it's totally based on wasting the customer's time. That's what it's about. And uh, that is the, uh, and the, the what they call ads on television aren't ads, they're minuses, because if people, people will pay to get rid of them. And uh, the future of uh, the, the chief promise of the internet is to uh, overcome the TV model. And so when you see people defining broadband at uh, levels below full motion video, you can be sure that the that uh, the TV interests are somehow in in infiltrating themselves into that uh, uh, process. But this is, this is the key development. Uh, this is, I, uh, 
predicted it in Life After Television way back in 1980. Television didn't die quite as fast as I thought. But it is happening. And the key to it is uh, Chris Anderson, who's the editor of Wired, wrote an article called The Long Tail, in which he documented that uh, the tremendous um, variety of people's interests and curiosities. And uh, people do not want more choice. They want their first choice. And, uh, and uh, Amazon, as a result, gets 60% of its revenues from its worst sellers. That is, uh, books below the first 300,000 books. All those revenues of their first 300,000 books, including all the top 10 and top 100 and all that, uh, bring in, I think it's something like 45% of their revenues, 44%. And, uh, and uh, 56 to 60% come from the additional million books or whatever. And the same kinds of numbers increasingly apply to Netflix, Netflix Netflix and Rhapsody and iTunes, all these, these uh, models. And the long tail do dooms the Hollywood and TV models. So when they come to you and want, want all of the technology world to be readjusted to accommodate their particular desires or their particular definition of intellectual property, you should be very resistant because it, they, they are uh, jeopardized by the new technologies, and they're going to f uh, fight uh, desperately uh, against, uh, against change. They ultimately probably will benefit from it, as they usually do, but uh, they lack the vision to see that. And the long tail, ultimately, uh, it's, it's not a, a dinosaur's tail. So, uh, and the, holly, the hit model, the hits that you, uh, that, uh, uh, where, where it's believed that if you have a bookstore with just the, ta just the best sellers, or a record store with just the most popular records, or, or a advertising model in which only the biggest companies can advertise, uh, which is the television model, uh, that's all going to die. It, uh, the Hollywood TV hit model derived from a scarcity of theatrical space. There are just not very many theaters, not enough time in the day. Uh, time is scarce. And uh, so, uh, so hits prevailed. But uh, now the change is there's effectively, they're gonna, everybody's going to have a movie theater in their house, essentially. Not just uh, TV, but a a really uh, high resolution, beautiful kind of uh, maybe liquid crystal or, or more advanced uh, kind of screen that uh, essentially reproduces the movie experience better in your, um, in your home. And uh, there'll be as many, that pretty much dooms the TV hits only on schedule model although the theaters have to do other things and they are increasingly becoming social centers and doing all, but, but, uh, but, they, uh, but people will be watching tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of different movies rather than, rather than the 60 uh, that Hollywood deigns to give us. And uh, stations, TV stations were scarce. Uh, there'd be as many sources of video as there are nodes on the network. So, uh, this is, uh, uh, so th the wasting the span of life of the engineers, the, the current model just doesn't really uh, function anymore. And, uh, and meanwhile, our, while we twiddle uh, in the courts, our uh, manufacturing ability deteriorates. Now, where I really come from in this area is the, uh, is writing about chips. So I'm perfectly uh, willing to believe that pharmaceuticals are different. I think they are different. They're discrete products. They, they, don't, they aren't incremental most of the time. Uh, you need to <coughs> compensate for the 
huge burdens imposed on this process by the FDA with some kind of uh, compensatory uh, force or you won't have uh, new pharmaceuticals, particularly for diseases without uh, uh, rarer than uh, the ones that currently attract most of the attention. Um, but uh, I've been writing about uh, the uh, inventions all my for the last 30 years and uh, and, and I was, in none of these inventions did the issue of patents really arise very significantly until long after the invention had prospered. In other words, uh, the use of patents was chiefly uh, to um, capture revenues that had already been de demonstrated by companies that had uh, actually launched uh, the invention. And uh, I've just, uh, The Silicon Eye is my new book, which is all about a whole series of issues in intellectual property and uh, in the world of cameras and imagers. And, and it uh, uh, is uh, about a new kind of imager that really was based on simulating the human retina eventually. And uh, this uh, retina project ended up um, being an important contribution to the understanding of the functioning of the human eye and was on the cover of Scientific American, a picture of a blurry cat uh, in 1990. But, uh, these, uh, but Carver's rule is, I think, really significant uh, to the whole study of intellectual property and patents. If you can't build it, you don't understand it. And one of the, why this issue that I'm raising here about actually reducing to significant practice whatever kind of innovation you accomplish is that uh, much of our intellectual life uh, consists of free-floating ideas of people who can't possibly build any of the things they casually uh, pretend to innovate. And uh, this, uh, you know, they were going to build a brain. I'm not good. This, these are uh, about this book. But I think uh, one of the issues in the book was whether it was going to be possible to build a conscious machine, a machine with consciousness. And I thought uh, Nobel laureate Max Delbruck was the father of one of the founders of uh, Foveon, this company that uh, invented the new imager. And his view is the effort of biologists to reduce the, he's a Nobel laureate, began as a physicist like most of the great biologists. And um, which is true, almost all the in, uh, great inventions that launched bioengineering came from physicists. Uh, the effort of biologists to reduce the brain to purely material elements reminds me of nothing so much as Baron Munchausen's effort to extract himself from a swamp by pulling on his own hair. Uh, this whole idea of, of intellectuals attempting to reduce their ideas to mere material brain is uh, a quixotic or Munchausen. Uh, but uh, patented ideas can no more produce a useful product than patented materials can produce an idea. The idea must be joined to a productive process and a material embodiment. And so I really, that really is the bottom line of the problem with uh, patenting ideas. Ideas are not, uh, they, they are abundant, they aren't scarce. Uh, what's scarce is the ability to take these ideas and put them in a physical form that can function and serve effectively in the world. And, uh, and I think s software uh, can and join to hardware in ways that the Europeans are wrestling with. I read uh, uh, Dr. Bray, uh, Robert Bray's uh, paper last night, and it, it was fascinating to see the endless difficult wrestling with the uh, with the ways that ideas can be interwoven with technical inventions and uh, become, in fact, uh, 
inventive, become uh, valuable. And, and, it's, uh, and I think the Europeans are, uh, do have at the heart the right notion of this. And, and I think that uh, we should get away from uh, patenting all these uh, free-floating ideas and then uh, letting uh, Nathan Mervold uh, buy them and then uh, litigate. It seems to me to be a, a pretty uh, uh, futile course. Um, well, Carver's goal in Fovion was a camera that collected light from all three primary colors at every pixel. You know, the current digital cameras <coughs> all collect light one primary color at each pixel and then calculate uh, the other colors by the neighboring pixels so, so that the actual uh, uh, imager is uh, computing the image rather than actually registering the image by registering all the light at every pixel. And uh, Carver Mead, who is the, one of the heroes of this book, uh, managed with uh, his team in the process of developing this retina chip, emulating the human eye, managed to uh, create a, a, a chip that could, um, could actually uh, be a camera chip that captured all the light. And it's now only in one uh, camera called the, the Sigma camera, the Sigma 10 camera in Japan, which has won all sorts of prizes. But the, the essence of this imager is that it is, uh, uh, can, is in ordinary CMOS, ordinary silicon technology, and thus can be uh, uh, built in volume for 80 cents. And it uh, combines still with motion photography because it all, all occurs on the image plane itself, on the silicon image plane itself. Uh, it can, uh, you can do 30, 40 frames a second, uh, potentially, of high resolution images. So, you can, so it can be a camcorder as well. And, uh, but uh, there were, you know, there were hundreds of patents relating to every conceivable kind of camera and imager. And, uh, and I, I, it didn't stop anybody. I mean, they, uh, some of them were at Canon and some at Sony and some at uh, um, Kodak. They were all over the place. Uh, so this new imager, just completely novel in its uh, actual capabilities, was... Uh, faced all kinds of uh, prior art, as it were, but uh, nobody had ever been able to make one before. And this was really the case with the microprocessor as well. Everybody had the idea of putting a computer on a chip. As soon as they invented the, mic uh, the integrated circuit, it was clear to put more and more on it. When you had, had 4,000 transistors on a device, you could, uh, you could put a calculator essentially on it, an arithmetic logic unit could be inscribed on it. And so uh, for people to come forward after the microprocessor is launched, essentially by Intel, which managed to put 4,000 uh, transistors on a chip, not uh, managed to conceive of the idea of a computer on a chip. Lots of people had that idea. Only a few people um, actually took the trouble to patent it. And, and, and uh, Gilbert Hyatt came back, I think it's Gilbert Hyatt, came back later and, and won quite a big settlement from Intel for some, uh, when the device he built had nothing to do with the kind of single chip microprocessor system that Intel pursued. So, so chief, uh, the chief uh, issue about patents to me is that uh, th they aren't positive. They don't really enable you to do anything. They enable you to stop other people from doing things. And as a result, they are very easily adaptable to mischievous litigation, but they 
uh, don't elicit a great deal of uh, creative activity. Now, this, this is my impression from uh, the semiconductor industry where there are, uh, where essentially they've given up on patents. Um, uh, patents come from the Latin word meaning to lie open. And information that lies open can be freely used by rivals. Um, property really consists of what cannot be freely appropriated by others. Uh, you uh, patent something and it's out there. Um, latent comes from the Latin word to lie hidden. And uh, if it lies hidden, it's yours. And, and uh, the microchip business, everybody cross-licenses all their patents. And so you, um, pretty much, so that uh, patents really have been, uh, are purely defensive in the microchip business. They just are not, if you couldn't uh, sort out all the patents, it wouldn't work with a device with uh, 600, 700 different process steps, each process step full of in ingenuity, uh, every circuit structure, every uh, uh, chip topology, all, all of them original ideas, and very few of them actually patented. Uh, they, uh, if it matters, uh, if it makes a difference, you don't want to patent it. Uh, in the microchip business. That's sort of, you patent things that are already over the hill, you patent things that, that, are, that you may want to spin out to another company, you, it, you, but you don't actually, um, most of the lore, most of the, late, the tacit knowledge which really differentiates one semiconductor company to another is late, not uh, uh, patent. And, uh, and then that's, and ideas in electronics are kind of easy. They mostly consist of putting extant products, computers, cameras, phones, whatever, on microchips. And uh, actually, uh, this is what Hoff wanted to do. And it's the, what's hard is not the patents, but the latents. And uh, that's really um, the essence of, of the argument. And it's, there are just lots of, examples. So I think the key, the key is to get, restore the old regime, uh, which is really the non-obvious, the duh factor should really be eliminated from the patent office. And uh, reduction to practice, as it's called, uh, is, uh, should be reestablished as a critical element. And, uh, and I think that uh, it just, these stories, you can uh, I tell a lot of stories about uh, the way patents actually work in this uh, field. And at the heart of it all, I think, is information theory. And uh, in information theory, and uh, this is well, my final point, is information theory, information's measured as entropy, unexpected uh, developments, news, uh, it's, uh, and, uh, it's, uh, and information is measured by its unpredictability, it's, it's uh, surprisal, as some people call it. And the uh, key rule of information is it takes a low entropy carrier, no surprises, to bear a high entropy message with news or innovation. This is why all uh, communications tend to migrate to the electromagnetic spectrum with its pure sine waves that uh, are all perfectly predictable. And because they're perfectly predictable, they can bear most of the information of the global economy. And the law, too, should be predictable. You shouldn't need to have all kinds of insurance policies uh, to uh, uh, protect yourself against uh, unexpected irrational outbreaks of law. And so, uh, so I think that's, the, that's the, the key to it. And uh, must uphold the non-obvious rule and bar 
obvious internet patents uh, and reduced to practice, and Qualcomm is another example of a co company that uh, is now known for its patents, but in fact, the reason Qualcomm dominated communications technology is because it built everything. It built the infrastructure, it built the handsets, it, it uh, deployed service networks, it, uh, it completely demonstrated, reduced to practice all its ideas, and then it became the world's leading a uh, fabulous semiconductor company, did, and it's, which it is today. And uh, a key point is, uh, is that uh, property, isn't, property must be defensible or it's not really property. What an entrepreneur does is not only generate new business models, that's critical for his activity, but also he defines defensible intellectual property. And if it's not defensible, it's not really intellectual property. Uh, if, uh, if, uh, if you have a few people steal your product, you've got a police problem. But if you have uh, millions of customers stealing your product, you have a marketing problem. And you have, to, you have to figure out how to sell your good at a price where people, and, and collect the money efficiently is crucial, and that's what Apple did with iPod, and uh, they figured out how to collect quite a lot of money legitimately uh, in a way that, uh, that uh, has been a great success. So uh, I could, uh, I th did we go till two? I could answer questions if anybody has questions. the patent for your analysis versus any other patent that a business could obtain. When you discuss the business patent and you talk about businesses have incentives to develop strategies to compete, mm -hmm. don't they have the same sort of uh, incentives to develop processes and products that are better to compete and so therefore don't need the patent for the same argument of reason? Well, I, 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 I'm for retrenching patents and applying them to really non-obvious major steps forward. That is true. But, uh, but still, a business is a system for testing business methods. That's, that's what, it, what it does. And so, and, and the reward for a successful business method is a profit. If, and, uh, and to have an additional reward uh, f that somehow applies to some subjective measure of novelty in the business method seems to me to be gratuitous. And if it's, oh, Occam's razor says you don't need uh, another layer of uh, enterprise focused on uh, proving that business methods should be uh, given a 17-year monopoly. So much better that allows me to sell that better and then creates its own profit and it effectively creates its It'll own be a lot better if lots of people copy it. I mean, that's... So it seems to me that the same argument would apply to any sort of patentable process or product. I, th I think that, uh, you, you know, when you look at a, dr a, a, a patent of a uh, drug that takes nine years and $800 million to launch, uh, you know, to award some kind of extensive uh, time to enjoy the benefits of that kind of massive effort is legitimate. I, do, I don't think that, uh, I mean, it, it, I think uh, Bezos is embarrassed by the one-click one, uh, shopping uh, patent he got. I mean, it's, 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 it's almost a parody of the, of the patent process, but you're, it's, uh, you know, the patents are an extreme, th are, an, are an extreme measure. They are not a routine uh, and an obvious kind of expression of a capitalist system. So you need an extreme justification for them. And just an, analog an analogy doesn't suffice to justify it. Uh, and, uh, and I, I do believe that, the, that 
you know, the um, business method patents really don't pass the laugh test, and that is, so they they shouldn't be uh, awarded anymore. I just think it's uh, it's a, it was a mistake, and it probably will be uh, rescinded. I don't know. You guys know better than I. Are are, are people uh, patenting a lot more business methods these days? I don't. I don't know. It's um, mischievous question, really. Um, would you advise all these guys around here to go and retrain as engineers? <laughs> what I, the question is whether I would advise everybody to retrain as engineers. I, I gathered a number of you are engineers who are retraining as lawyers, which is a little, <laughs> a little alarming. But anyway, uh, um, I, you know. The, it, it, a good a good legal system is absolutely critical to uh, to capitalism. It's the it's that uh, low entropy, reliable structure which can enable the efflorescence of of uh, ideas and goods and services and uh, responding to the needs of others. It's really critical, and that's why it's so crucial to get it right. And not, uh, and what I think is the cancer of capitalism is when uh, lawyers go out there like uh, like um, Nathan is encouraging, I gather, and uh, go out there and exploit anomalies in the law in order to enrich uh, the legal system. And I think that is that really is a cancer of capitalism. Applying the entrepreneurial capability to exploiting the law for profit rather than uh, sustaining the law and uh, rendering it more rational and uh, better capable of serving uh, the nation and the world. Now we have a global economy, the Lord knows. Remember the rule quoted this morning that said that the market will ultimately be the best the distributor or rational rationalizer of resources. And that business model of buying up that, that patent property and then seeking its highest value, that's just another phenomenon of the market. You know, I, I, I think it's, you know, what it really is, it's kind of a racket, though, to come back. You know, all these, these patents have been, uh, you know, been out there, and, and many times the company has gone broke or whatever. And it, which is in the case with Mervold, collecting a lot of old uh, sort of lapsed patents that still have some liveliness and finding some poor company that somehow can be uh, charged with infringing and then extorting money from them before uh, the, the litigation ever comes to court. I, I just think that whole model is abusive. And uh, you know, I'm sure people, maybe Nathan and his sponsors, which include Microsoft and Sony and all these other, have some exalted purpose in mind. But uh, it's not evident to me at the moment. Yeah, it's it's not the, the evil isn't owning the property and enforcing it. The evil is how the legal system has fallen upon its own breadth heft in in the cost of uh, nuisance value suit. Yeah, I think it's a good point. Before we thank uh, Mr. Gilder, let me just apologize to those sponsors. I was obviously working off of a partial list when I acknowledged some of our sponsors before, and I see we have a much larger list, and I thank some of our favorite law firms, in particular Nelson Mullins and, and Parker Poe for, for being on that list. But um, let's uh, thank you very much. Well, thank uh, you. Thank you. It was fun to be here. I've, I've learned.